in three, two, one. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, we're here for Get Ahead in English. Um, this evening we're going to be looking at one of the poems in the AQA Power and Conflict Anthology. It's called Tissue by Imtiaz Darker. Um, as ever, just a few um, things as reminders. Uh, we are going out live. If you are watching this live and you're one of the people online now and you'd like to ask questions, or you have a comment or you have feedback and you want to type that into the Q&A window on Microsoft Teams, you can you can do that for, sh for sure. And, and Olivia will feed back uh, any of those questions during the session. If not, um, then just relax, take some notes. Something that's useful for these poetry sessions is a copy of the poem, um, preferably on paper in front of you. So if you want to pause the video, if you're able to do that and go away and find the poem, um, that would be ideal. Um, so we are going, going to cover, we've been covering poems that um, I might argue that some teachers tend to leave till last um, or students find difficult. Um, they're the poems that my classes have found difficult. It's a bit of extra training for me, really, because I'd like to uh, get to know them a little bit better. And this one often comes up as one that students either find very difficult to write about um, or can't find the, the right ideas um, and I hope that you'll find something within this 50 minutes um, that you'll be able to take forward potentially into your exams. So Tissue appears in the AQA cluster for um, the Power and Conflict unit for poetry and um, so it will be an optional poem for GCSE um, depending on what's printed or what you choose if you choose to use to compare it with others. Um, by way of the final introduction it's me James Harper head of English at West Somerset College um, and this will be the penultimate session that we do on power and conflict. All right, so tissue then. Um, very much a poem that um, I've had to work on myself. A poem that naturally isn't, didn't jump out at me as a favorite. Um, I know that a lot of teachers are a little bit nervous about teaching it. I have very experienced colleagues in my own school um, that will come to me or will go to other teachers and say, have you got some ideas about how to teach tissue? Um, but I'm going to try and establish something today that I did with the emigre, which is that this is a poem that if you feel up to the challenge could be really, really fruitful in an exam. So I want you to keep an open mind um, and I want you to think about the poem afresh as if it's the first time you've studied it. This is a masterclass, so it's aimed at the higher grades, but a lot of what I'm going to do today will also be really, really useful at grades four to six. So a little bit as we do normally about the poet uh, themselves as Imtiaz Darker. She's born, as you can see, in 1954. Um, she was born in Lahore in Pakistan um, and from a very young age, she was less than a year old and her family moved, uh, emigrated to Glasgow um, and <clears throat> that's where um, she kind of settled for her childhood and teenage years. Nowadays, she spends her time split between Mumbai and India and in London. She's also a filmmaker, uh, particularly in, in documentary form. Um, and a visual artist as well, so a, a really talented um, person. Describes herself as a Scottish Muslim Calvinist, um, so she's really kind of in touch with uh, the different heritages that make up um, her, her being really. Um, she's you know very attached to Pakistan but also has a real connection to India Interestingly, um, she is um, a Muslim and believes and follows Islam, but she also has Christian values as well that um, show the bridge between kind of major world religions. And Caroline Duffy, one of my favourite poets, once said that if there were ever to be a world poet laureate, she would be the top candidate. Um, there are very few modern poets who are as knowledgeable and well-traveled and immersed in different cultures and different ideas as Imtiaz Darker. And you'll know that um, from previous sessions, Simon Armitage is the current Poet Laureate. It's a title um, that's given to him, I think, for 10 years. 
um, and the poet, the poet laureates writes poems um, that reflect the mood of the nation on big occasions like the Queen, the King's sorry coronation or the Queen's death. Um, Armitage written poems for those things, um, and Duffy was the poet laureate before Armitage. Um, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote in charge of the Light Brigade, which we'll be doing as our final poem next week, um, was poet laureate back in back in the Victorian era uh, at the time of the Crimean War. But anyway, that's that's more than you need to know about the poet. Um, but some interesting things here about the poem. It's tempting to do the reading first, actually, here. So whatever floats your boat, if you want to pause it and do and, and do the reading of the poem first and then come back to this, you could. Um, <clears throat> but there's some really interesting little tidbits that you can take from uh, this slide. So please take a couple of notes that you could use. Um, this is a difficult poem in many people's minds because many of its images and its ideas could be held up to multiple interpretations. But those of you who know something about how English exams are marked, um, and it shouldn't be all about exams, uh, and, and I do apologise if I talk about exams all the time rather than the love of literature, which is what I'm really all about. But I think that if you are thinking of exams, you'll know that English is marked for multiple interpretations. Certainly the higher grades, you want to hold up a quotation and say, well, we could interpret it this way, or we could interpret it this way, or this might suggest this, or this might imply this. And actually that tentative nature um, really lends itself well to this poem because you are able to explore multiple different avenues for um, uh, certain quotations. And I'll I'll explain what I mean as the session goes on. But I really want you to think about that. Whereas maybe a poem a little bit more, I don't know, like kamikaze possibly. I'm trying to think of the more kind of rigid poems. Um, or even checking out the history. You don't, can't really explore multiple lines of inquiry on quotations on those poems. They're, there, they're, they're kind of quite concrete. Um, so I, I think that, that tissue does really lend itself well um, to open interpretation. All right, which I've summed up there. And it's exciting to write about if you're up for that challenge. But at its heart, this is the poem. Tissue paper used as an extended metaphor for life. And what's tissue paper? It's fragile, but it's also adaptable. Paper can be used for multiple different purposes. Paper can carry new meanings if it's written on, for example, or if it's folded up into a piece of origami or into a paper kite. Um, it could be made um, into different forms of structure. Um, you know, you can do lots and lots of things with paper. And if we think predominantly as English students that we write on paper um, and that we create meaning through paper and we think about poetry or we think about novels, we think about plays or we think about artwork and drawings um, or perhaps about kind of history or science or mathematics. These are all forms um, that paper might be used for. And so paper is hugely adaptable. If you think about the other poems, this is something that's useful. If you think about other, the other 14 poems in the anthology, um, we could do a little continuum of the, the bleakest or the, the most kind of depressing and, and least optimistic poems up to the most optimistic and hopeful. And I think you'd agree probably that Tissue is one of those poems that feels up on the hopeful and optimistic side of things. I'm thinking quickly scrolling through in my head the other 14 poems and most of them are pretty dark. You know, they you might expect that from a the, from a cluster of poems about conflict. But this is one that's unusually generous um, and hopeful. And I think you should make that point. Um, I think it's a useful point to make. Just hold the poem up to the light um, and see how it's different to any of the others. However, um, this this poem tissue was taken from the 2006 uh, darker collection called The Terrorist at My Table. There used to be a poem in the old specification um, that Dark had written. I think it was called This Room, um, which was was about um, 
about terrorism. Um, and, you know, we might find some of those threads in tissue, but really um, that was a collection of poems about some very heavy subjects, global politics, terrorism, extremism, religious funda fundamentalism. Um, and tissue is, is kind of deep and, and heavy in that sense, um, but it acts as a kind of a light contrast in its tone to lots of the other poems in the anthology that she put together. That's a really useful bit of literary context to write about because we've got a poem here, even among Darker's own poems, that is lighter, no pun intended on her surname, um, than, than most of the, the rest of her collection. So I might write that the poem works in a similar way in its original anthology then. Um, it was the first, it's the first poem in that book as well. Um, so it acts as a form of a preface to the heavier matter, um, which is all about toxic power and abuse of power um, and control and those sorts of things. So it might be interesting to write about that um, and, and feel your way around the tone of the poem before you start to zoom into your individual quotations. Um, so to, to sum it up, if you hear my children um, chatting away in the background or, or crying, I apologise. They're lovely, really. Um, the poem is a meditation on the ephemeral nature of life. Ephemeral, just a posh word for the fact that it doesn't last forever. Um, and the power of memory as well. It's a celebration of the human body as well, because the idea or the motif of tissue um, comes to us at the end of the poem um, as human tissue, as living tissue. So it feels like she wants to make the points that we share something, perhaps not just uh, in the word itself, but uh, in terms of its semantics with paper. The darker's words are both beautiful and haunting, and they leave the reader with much to think about. So that's a nice little summary. Um, so hopefully there's something on that slide that you can take away um, and learn or might be a refresher on something you already know. All right, so we're 12 minutes in um, and I think it's time to do the reading of the poem. So you've got it in front of you, you can just look at your paper copy, um, otherwise you can read from your screen with me. Tissue. Paper that lets the light shine through, this is what could alter things. Paper thinned by age or touching, the kind you find in well-used books, the back of the Quran, where a hand has written in the names and histories, who was born to whom, the height and weight, who died where and how, on which sepia date, pages smoothed and stroked and turned transparent with attention. If buildings were paper, I might feel their drift, see how easily they fall away on a sigh, a shift in the direction of the wind. Maps too, the sun shines through their borderlines, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, fine slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit cards might fly our lives like paper kites. An architect could use all this, place layer over layer, luminous script over numbers over line, and never wish to build again with brick or block, but let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths, through the shapes that pride can make. Find a way to trace a grand design with living tissue, raise a structure never meant to last, of paper smoothed and stroked and thinned to be transparent, turned into your skin. There you go. It's a lovely poem to read out loud because it has this kind of quite slow language quality to it. It's beautiful in its sound and it needs to be heard to be appreciated. And you must listen to Imtiaz Darka read it as well, rather than, than me and, and hear, hear the poet. She's got a beautiful voice. And I have a video on the end of this um, presentation today. If we have time, um, I'll play. But obviously you can find the same clip on YouTube. It's going to be a bit weird playing a YouTube clip through this form. 
But the main part of this session, as always, is to do some line by line analysis. So that's what we're going to do now. So pens at the ready, highlighters at the ready, taking some notes um, from the screen or just listening and picking out things for your revision. Um, OK, so that what I've done is taken these stanzas um, in turn here today. Um, so these are all quatrains apart from the final stanza, which is a single line. It's pretty well uh, structured and organized there. Um, and although there's no rhyme pattern here in the poem, really, there are rhymes in the text. Um, it's still relatively well organized in that sense, quite traditional. And the first word in the poem is always useful, and that word is paper. Um, so the poem begins with a notion of paper, um, and it's repeated regularly, particularly in the opening couple of stanzas. Um, so that motif um, begins there. All right. Um, and she talks about paper letting the light shine through. Now, like the emigre, which is a nice partner poem for this one, we have the motif of light. Um, light shining. So what I would ask you, um, were I your teacher, what we think about light then? If it's a motif, it's going to represent something beyond its most obvious meanings. It's repeated regularly um, and here it's a, it's a kind of a concept, I suppose. So you might think here about transparency, about beauty, it's light shining through things. So perhaps it's impermanent. Um, it's maybe sunlight, which is not um, something we have all of the time. So we want to think about that. And if it's light shining through things, it might also be uh, a motif that suggests truth um, and honesty. Um, if light can shine through things. And she talks about light shining through later on, and we'll see if that works later on too. Paper that lets the light shine through, this is what could alter things. Now something I didn't put on the PowerPoint slide is that she uses this modal verb could um, or words like might very regularly. Um, there's a couple of different ways in which we could talk about that in an exam. So we might think might suggest doubt or could suggest out. But actually, in the context of the poem, a different reading might be of hope. Um, I feel that this is a, a really positive, optimistic poem. Um, so although she's tentative, it's like she's excited by the prospect of change in the world, that actually we should be treating each other and treating the environment um, with a degree more respect and uh, praising it, I suppose, than we currently do. So that's a good point on could, and I'll, I'll, come, I'll perhaps come back to that a little bit later. Um, she talks about altering things, paper that lets the light shine through, being having the power to alter things. So in what ways might paper alter things? And later on in the poem, she will explore some of those ideas. If this is your first reading of the poem, though, um, you might have some of your own ideas. How is paper powerful? We've already talked a little bit in the introduction about how paper can have things printed on it or written on it um, that are powerful. Uh, the written word is a political tool. The written wor word can be inspirational, although it can also divide us. Um, and can cause great pain and suffering as well. Um, but this isn't any old paper she's talking about. It's paper that allows light through it. So this is a combination of paper with beauty and, and hope and truth. Paper thins by age or touching. There's a lot in this poem um, that immediately connects paper to the human body. Um, thinned to me is first and foremost the quality of the paper right we don't need to overanalyze if it's something there there's something there so we know what thin paper looks like it's the sort of paper you'd find in a very old book or in an old religious text like the bible or the quran which is referenced um, and you know this these are pages that are well worn 
um, that tell their own stories because they've been around the block and lots of people have touched them or lots of people have, have used them. But things by age or touching really focuses, I think, on the human aspect, so the, the way in which human beings are able to be associated with paper. And this is a very human poem. Um, and those verbs there are, feel intimately associated with the human form. Um, uh, I hope you see what I mean. I think we've got here this coalescing of the two forms, the human body and paper, as it does again at the end of the poem. Paper that lets the light shine through. This is what could alter things. Paper thinned by age or touching. The kind you find in well used books. So well used is a nice other alternative synonym really for thinned and and, and paper thinned or, 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 or worn by touching. You know, this is what she's driving at here. Look at the second person use in the poem. Um, it's not a big matter, but the fact that she uses the word you um, is conversational perhaps, but also is clearly addressing a reader or a listener in second person. But it feels universal. It feels like wisdom being passed down. And um, it's similar in that way to Storm on the Island, which also addresses a you, you know what I mean. So conversational, or where the speaker has a degree of wisdom or perception um, that, uh, that the listener kind of wants to pick up on. The kind you find in well-used books, the back of the Quran, where a hand is written in the names and histories, who was born to whom, comma, and we'll, we'll leave that hanging for a moment. Um, so the Quran is, and it's spelt in different ways in English, but is the holy book of Islam. Um, and I think, you know, darker, obviously raised as a Muslim. She is somebody who's connected to this, this, this holy text. Um, and it shows us that paper can take on many different meanings and beliefs and whether that be the Bible um, or whether that be um, the, the, the Quran or another religious text or whether it be a book of poetry or a book of uh, literature or you kind know, of associated with anything that has this kind of more spiritual profound effect the way in which religion um, can tie us together or indeed can separate us um, shows how powerful paper can be um, now that the power of paper and the power of humans and communities again being tied together isn't it and in the back of the quran um where a hand is written in the names and histories, who was born to whom. I spent some time living in a Middle Eastern country, and I know that, strictly speaking, not supposed to write in the Quran. Um, you know, that is the, the preserve um, of kind of the, the, the word of God as reported to Muhammad. But this is the, this is quite an interesting take that perhaps there's a slip of paper that's in the back of that book um, that shows you um, history, kind of personal family history. And Darker uses an asyndetic list. The asyndeton is simply using a list with commas rather than ands. So if you look at it, there's, I think there's four different uh, items and names and histories are tied together, who was born to whom and so on. So paper here isn't just the Quran, it's also valuable memories, the records here of family history, whole lives recorded on paper. This is feels like a family tree. This feels like almost as the speaker looks through this book and finds this book, there is history being traced. Um, over over uh, over generation upon generation layers this poem is a lot about has a lot about layers as well note how the religious text takes on additional significance so clearly the quran for muslims is going to be the most important text um certainly in their spiritual life um but by conflating it here with the histories and the names of of, of family, it adds that familial dimension, that personal dimension as well. 
A hand is written in the names and histories, who was born to who, for height and weight, who died where and how, on which sepia date. So a couple of things to look at there. Um, height and weight seem like fairly innocuous words, so maybe when the child is born, um, his or her height and weight are recorded on this on this piece of paper um, or indeed it's tracked through a child's development as well. So height and weight is an I rhyme. So the words are look like they should rhyme, um, don't they, on the page, but they don't. So we don't pronounce it height and weight or hate and weight. Um, we pronounce it height and weight. Now, is there a good point to make here? Um, it's playful. Um, it's as you read it, you expect initially those words to rhyme, certainly at very first glance, and they don't. And there's something propulsive um, by um, the use of that I rhyme. And interesting, I haven't included it on the slide, you, but you can hear it on the following line. The word date rhymes with weight, which is an internal rhyme. Um, and we get another one of those later. Um, which kind of increases the pace, I would suggest, along with the asyndetic list of so those commas. Um, so if you read that again, where a hand has written the names and histories, who was born to whom, the height and weight, who died where and how, on which sepia date, comma, then we get pages smoothed and stroked and turned transparent with attention. It slows down there. And how does it slow down? Because now she uses and. So that's called polysyndeton. So it's a polysyndetic list here of smoothed and stroked and turned transparent with attention. I love that. Um, that these um, pages, whether within the book of the Quran or on the pages of notes from the family history, um, they are smoothed and stroked and turned transparent with attention. Smoothed and stroked feels like how you would treat a child or a doll. Um, and it's gentle. And the S and the W sound repeated on in this stanza in particular um, has a kind of a gentle, wistful quality to it as well. Um, and that might be something you look at. The word attention is interesting as well, because by that full stop, our attention is very much on this document. Um, and the full stop there is the second in the poem. I was going to thought it might be our first, actually. Um, but it's a long sentence. If you look at it as a sentence, we start here, paper thin by age or touching, and then it ends there, transparent with attention, full stop drawing our attention to this point in the poem. So I hope there's something there that you can talk about. We can talk about sepia, um, the connotations of sepia, if something sepia tinted has this faded brown quality to it um, that feels as though it's authentic or it's of the past. OK, let's move on. So the conditional term, we talked about could and might, and we have if here as well, and then might later in the same line. If buildings were paper. All right, so far so good. I feel like everyone kind of gets what she's talking about um, in the first couple of, of stanzas. But then we start to talk about the more abstract, and then some students kind of lose the plot a bit. So let's pretend that it's not that complicated. We could we could create buildings from paper. What are buildings representing here? Something that is um, concrete or something that is important or you need to live somewhere and we need to have a roof over our head and we need to go to school and so on. But the idea of buildings being paper seems to be something because they are they allow the light through and because they are intimately connected with the human condition are something that maybe we should do we should think about if conditional uncertainty possibility but also excitement and a hope for the future i might feel their drift if you catch somebody's drift as a colloquial idea to catch somebody's drift they understand them so there's two meanings here, all right, because the, the word drift 
might also be to do with movement, of course, and it might be to do with the wind blowing the paper building down. But to feel or to catch someone's drift is to understand them. She thinks if buildings were made with paper, or at least were imbued with the same sort of quality that paper has her examples earlier, then she might actually connect with them more. We get the sense that Darker believes very much that maybe modern architecture isn't something to be particularly proud of. It doesn't let the light through. Think of all those concrete buildings in our towns and cities. So she wants to feel their drift. And I suppose then she wants the buildings to not last forever, for them to blow down, um, to see how easily they fall away on a sigh. A shift in the direction of the wind. Look again at how the rhyme of drift and shift are irregular. Like in the previous stanza on um, weight and date, what we get here is drift and shift. It's almost as if we would expect those at the end of lines, um, but here it's irregular, as if the wind has blown the words apart. There's a fragility then and an impermanence to the language. Um, it's all about drifting and shifting and, and the rhymes drift and shift apart from one another as well. So a little bit pretentious, but those are the sorts of ideas examiners are going to credit for you um, because you've thought carefully about her use of language. How easily you fall away on a sigh. Again, a human feature, a human emotion. Um, a shift in the direction of the wind. So she's thinking here about the abstraction of buildings and of paper. What does she mean by buildings being paper here, really? Again, another line we've talked about, but I think might be worth you considering your own interpretations, or definitely will, is, um, so that you can come up with something in an exam that you're proud of. My go-to point here would be that buildings being made of paper would imbue them with something that is more transient, that is more um, impermanent and therefore might carry more meaning. It's an interesting one though, isn't it? Because if she's making the link between the dates and the, 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 the family history in the back of the Quran, well, that's been around for, for centuries perhaps. Um, and what we have here, is we have the idea that she's actually seems to be wanting buildings to take on um, a sense of impermanence. Maps too. Look how excited she sounds here. Maps too. Um, so we think about maps and we think about the fact that they are also on paper um, and they're printed or they're in the past were maybe drawn by hand. Um, but borderlines, she then talks about the sun shines through their borderlines, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, and I'll go on later. But so we think about maps, and um, there's something quite romantic about maps, and um, there's something um, every culture um, has has its own maps, and cartographers in the past were considered kind of very interesting, and they probably still are very interesting people, but really well valued in society. Um, and, but if we think about maps, maps are, particularly on a global scale, are all about borders and about division, as well as um, of identification, if you like. Um, and those of you know about kind of Pakistan and India and Bangladesh, um, and borders and the trouble that borders can cause and so on. Um, and Darker would be intimately associated with those ideas. So we know that borders, borders and um, division causes conflict and causes war um, as well. It's not dark in the way that a poem like the Emigre, for example, might make it out to be. Um, but she, so she allows the sun to shine through their borderlines. So by holding the map up literally or metaphorically to the light, perhaps to the sun here, um, we see the borderlines disappear. The marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds. 
Look at the repetition there of the M and the R sound. They're fairly gentle um, alliteration. But there's layers there. So it goes M, then R, then M, then R, then R, then M. We've got layering and tying of different ideas together. If you're going to write about alliteration, quite often the best thing to say is that it ties ideas together. Um, and here it feels like the marks of the rivers and the roads and the rail tracks and the mountain folds all coalesce. If you hold it up to the sun, all of these things become one. Um, a natural coalescing of the man-made and the natural as well. So we've got the rivers are obviously natural, whereas the roads are not. So the mountain folds are natural, whereas the rail tracks are not. So again, it's not a poem where you can easily write P paragraphs on this simile suggests, for example, but you are with a poem like this are able to say multiple different things about any line in the text um, and the best students will be able to zoom back out and consider the whole. Everything flows, everything flows in this poem beautifully. And then we move to a slightly different focus. We talk about materialism and material goods. So paper is also used in receipts and receipts seem like a quite a modern phenomenon. And perhaps that's what she's driving at. But also receipts have been around um, for centuries and ever since presumably have had money of some sort, or not, maybe even predating money. Um, we've had receipts for goods and services. So there's a long history of mercantilism um, and she talks about fine slips from grocery shops. Um, they tell their own story. Shopping receipts tell their own story. Um, for me, because of the more cynical language, like the credit card in line three here, um, it feels a little bit critical. Find slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card might fly our lives like paper kites. The language becomes more factual and clinical, less poetic, less abstract, although that final line deserves some, some scrutiny. So she talks about the fine slips um, that are the receipts from from purchases from material items indeed or maybe from grocery shops not really um thing we need to eat to live and to survive sure um but in an ideal world maybe money um would fly our lives like paper kites but what does that mean there's an ambiguity in the language um again the the conditional might is important. There's lots of those words in this poem. It's tentative, but it's also hopeful. She want, Does she want those receipts to fly away? Or is she thinking that they control us? Or are maybe she wants to have control of them, like paper kites we might control. So my reading, the simple reading anyway, is that it might the simile suggests that there's too much focus on material goods. And we shouldn't allow money to control us, that they might it might fly away. Hopefully this all makes sense. And then we move on to another form of paper, although it returns to this idea of buildings. An architect could, another conditional modal, she sounds excited here, um, architect could use all this so what's the similarity between an architect for example and a poet well there are lots right architects design and create through the use of paper they add layers upon layers of line and so on it's a, effectively a creative pursuit um, it's a create the sense of creative spirit in architecture and in poetry for example or in any other form of art. So these, this is an art form. So <clears throat> she can, she's comparing the creative spirit of writers here to the grand designs of architecture. So an architect could use all this. Um, so instead of building buildings or designing buildings that are concrete um, monoliths or they are um, ugly skyscrapers, 
Um, she's suggesting that the fragility that is connected to paper and the stories that paper tells might make a better form. Um, I'm sure the three little pigs would have something to say about that. But she's suggesting that they could place layer over layer, luminous script over numbers over line, and never wish to build again with brick or block. Repetition of over. This is an example of form mirroring subject. It's an easy one as well to write about. So the repetition of over is particularly apt here because it's about layering. So we see, and there's alliteration on L, might be worth, just a gentle sound, isn't it? But she's suggesting that architects might place layer over layer, luminous script, so another, another word associated with light, or literally means light, um, over numbers, over line, and all of these are ideas that are connected to paper. Um, so the work of the poet here is mimicking the work of the architect. So by using the fragility and the intimate connection that one might have with paper and what's recorded on paper, we might never wish to build again with brick or block. So brick or block is on jambes between the stanzas. And I always think that enjambment is only really worth writing about if it's between stanzas in um, an exam. Um, and, and here's an ex a good example. Um, so the alliteration draws brick and block together, but the enjambment splits or separates them. Strictly speaking, she's not really using any metrical form that is consistent, so she could have used that or block at the end of the line. Instead, she's chosen to separate them. Um, so the alliteration ties the idea of brick and block together, but the enjambment disrupts them. Um, so you might be able to, to, to write about the disruptive nature. She wants to cause perhaps a disruption in the order of things or in the traditional way of doing things. Um, she also, by splitting them and alliterating them, draws the idea of solidity. Um, and a firm kind of uh, foundation for things and how brick and block are notably different from paper. All right, if we think about bricks and blocks, we think about, we don't think about light shining through them. Instead, she wants to let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths. All right, so these two words, big words, capitals and monoliths, feel um, powerful and imposing. They are words to do with state and with control. Um, a capital here might have two meanings. It might be to do with text. Um, and I think that's perhaps a deliberate ambiguity that you could go for. But for me, it also reminds me of capitals of countries, which are arbitrary and man-made, just like the maps might label them. She wants the daylight to break through again, these things. Look at the things she wants daylight to break through in the poem and make a, make a kind of a, a list of those ideas. These are large, imposing, man-made notions or structures. She says that it's, they're, they're hard to break down, but the simple idea of daylight um, might be able to break them down. Um, <clears throat> through the shapes that pride can make. Um, that word pride I haven't highlighted there, but to be proud of one's culture, um, of one's environment, is that something that we can do? I mean, it's up to you to discuss um, for yourself. There's great modern architecture um, and some of it's very beautiful. Um, but if we think about most of our cities and, and the buildings maybe that were constructed in the, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, they are rather ugly and grey. Um, and, you know, that's when I was born. Um, but those are from that generation and we've been a little bit more creative about how we build buildings nowadays but are we being creative enough or are we allowing light to shine through those things can we be proud 
And then we come to, I guess, the climax of the poem. We want to call it a climax. It's at the end of the poem and it feels like it's coming towards a climax. Um, she wants to find a way to trace a grand design. So trace, the word trace, we've well, we talked about lots of different forms of paper and what to put on paper and to trace something to trace a grand design. These words feel like a blueprint, which is what an architecture, architect, sorry, might use. Um, grand design is also an architectural idea, um, but it's also connected to human beings and God's creation. So sometimes um, it's just human beings are described as God's grand design, that we are um, in fact, God's greatest creation. Now, we could definitely argue the toss on that one, um, but it might be said that if we are made in God's image and so on, that um, that we are the grand design of um, the world. Also, we've got a responsibility um, to look after our environment and treat people in that way. And I think the point, the grand design and the human link there, you know, we are incredible, incredible as a species, aren't we? I think I think that's got to be deliberate because when you look at the final line of the poem in a second, all on its own, um, it's the human form, it's the human being, it's that, that kind of single upright human being. And it's you that she wants us to consider or you directly to consider what part you can play here. Um, anyway, find a way to trace a grand design with living tissue. Human, animal world. So living tissue. So here's the other form of tissue and it's let, it's hinted at through, through the poem, but it's only here in this penultimate stanza that we get it directly um, referred to. Raise a structure never meant to last. So I've, I've alluded to this earlier on in the presentation. Um, do we want to build structures that are meant to last forever or do we want them to break down and to fade away or indeed to die? Um, there's that arrogance of mankind to believe that we should create structures that are permanent um, as a legacy or is leg should legacy be left to the notes of paper in the back of the Quran where we can remember and recall generation upon generation rather than things that are monolithic? And you probably, those of you who know your poems well, will think of Ozymandias here potentially, um, a structure's meant to last. Well, Ozymandias certainly thought when that sculpture was going up that it should be. We might think of Storm on the Island um, and the fragility there of structures in that poem. So you can see where tissue might lend itself nicely to a, a, to a paired poem. All human beings are mortal. We haven't discovered um, an option to cheat death, right? So we are all mortal. If humans aren't meant to last, then perhaps we should think that buildings aren't meant to last. The constructions um, should not over serve a purpose, that they should be there as temporary structures. And then she returns to the, those lists of verbs again that we remember from earlier part of the poem, building towards the poem's climax, as I said earlier. Smoothed and stroked and thinned, we've seen that list before, to be transparent. So back to the touching of the paper in the first, in the end of the first stanza, um, a return to the delicacy rather than the aggressive um, concrete structures that feel like have been in the previous stanza and thinned to be transparent. So echoing the previous line, just so I can remember, smooth, there you go, smooth and stroked and turned, transparent with attention. And now we get smooth and stroked and thin to be transparent, turned into your skin. So that final single line is a direct reminder that we are connected directly to the world around us, that we are intrinsically connected, that we shouldn't separate ourselves from the buildings. We want to make things of our environment that 
mean something to us. And that's my reading, ladies and gentlemen, of the poem. Um, it's a tricky one because um, in, in, in the same heartbeat, I feel like it's really powerful and deeply felt and meaningful. And at the same time, there's a vagueness to it that feels, well, what is she actually, what does she actually want us to do here? And it's not a call to arms, like checking out my history feels like it's a call to arms or charge of the light brigade to remember these people. Or London, a deeply political poem. This is a poem that doesn't feel highly political, um, that feels more spiritual um, and gentle. Um, and, it, and it feels like a poem that different people might come at from very different angles. So don't treat my reading or anybody else's reading for that matter as the only reading of the poem. So hopefully that's helpful and hopefully you understand um, it a little bit better from the that reading. That final line on its own turned into your skin is almost like a little um, chill down the spine as it, as it as it pulls you directly into the poem again at the very end and asks you to consider your place in the world deep right now i'm not sure that this is going to work but i'm going to have a go and if you can't if this doesn't work or it comes out very very um uh fuzzily on through my microphone then obviously you can watch it on youtube <laughs> So if you type in Imtiaz Darker Performs Tissue, um, I'm playing this not really to hear her read the poem, though. I want to just listen to what she's got to say about the poem at the start. Um, and those of you who want to go on and do A-level or indeed degree level English will, will understand or will you will in the future understand. But it's not really about what the author wants anyway. When you're reading literature, great literature, it's about the the literature. It's about the text. It's not about Imtiaz Darker's background. It's not about what she might have wanted to say or convey. That might be interesting, but that's a distraction because it's about your interpretation. And that's the same at GCSE. Um, we want students, at, at uh, examiners want to, to read students' own points of view regardless of what the, the writer might have intended. So I'm not sure, um, Olivia, you can tell me if this isn't going to work, but I'm not sure if you're going to hear this perfectly, but I've turned my volume up and I'll put my microphone close to my speaker, um, but not too close. And let's see if this works. If it doesn't, um, you can find it online. Hi, sir. No sound coming through. No sound coming through. OK, so rather than me labour that issue, um, what I'd like you to do as a follow up, I've only got five minutes left anyway, as a follow up, I'd love you to go and watch this video. This is three minutes, 20 long. Um, <clears throat> and all you need to be able to do is really all I want you to do is listen to the first minute and a half. Then she reads it in her beautiful voice. Uh, in the second half of the poem, so that's a treat as well. Um, and then drop jot down a couple of things that she says that back up what we talked about tonight, um, or that maybe contradict some of the ideas. I think you'll find at least two or three bits that um, are useful. Anyway, shame that didn't work, but I had a feeling it might not. And that's the end of my session. So. If there are any questions or comments, um, then then please, Olivia, do share them. Otherwise, I will wrap up um, and I will remind you of what's coming next. OK. All right, so thanks for joining me today. The recordings of the sessions are on that link, www.mygetahead.org. And um, past recordings are easily available on the website as well. Just select the year group and the subject you require. All right. So I finished um, I'm 54 minutes. I normally go right to the hour. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope there's something that you've got from it. Your feedback would be really welcome. Take care. And next uh, Wednesday, we'll be doing the final poem in, uh, of the school year. Anyway, Charge of the Light Brigade by Tennyson. 
and let's try and squeeze some new um, ideas out of that one. Thank you very much.